if you don't mind, I'll do a short little introduction here. So good morning, everyone. Welcome again to another virtual breakfast. We, uh, we really appreciate you joining us. My name is Monica Jean, and I'm a field crops educator. I cover the Saginaw Bay region. And today we have Rich on for a little bit of a different topic, which is a lot of fun. And that's precision, precision agriculture reveals profits and losses at high resolution. So yes, this is a technology for ag presentation, but it's Monica, a real good one. I promise. Monica, yeah. I just wanted to say that Cristofanzo, who was scheduled for this morning, it, it was not able to present. She is on. Yes. She had a family emergency that actually prevented her from being able to uh, share with us this morning, but she will be on to answer some questions, but uh, we're glad that Rich was able to pinch it for us. Yeah, thanks Clay for asking, that's very nice of you. We're gonna have a bug and a disease update here at the at the end after Rich and the weather update is done with Jeff, so. All right, Rich, are you ready to go? Yeah, great. Thank you. So uh, like Monica said, my name is Rich. I work in Bruno Basso's Digital Ag Lab uh, on campus. And our main goal is to use precision data from agricultural implements and equipment and remote sensing to understand the way that the systems work. And so the discussion that I'll have today uh, talks directly to profits and negative profits, losses, uh, on each farm field and uh, how we can visualize that kind of at a high resolution. Hey, Rich, before we jump in, yep. did you have your, I, I realized you took your headphones and stuff off. Did you happen to have them to be able to put back in so we could hear you? Yeah, I have them in right now. Okay. Maybe it's just further away from the mic. You want me to okay. talk louder? A little, I'm sorry. <laughs> a little yeah. early. If you can. Let me finish the can. rest of my coffee. and then, Chug uh, your coffee. Yeah. 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 Okay. All <laughs> Thank right. you. So when I just uh, talk about precision agriculture, we're focusing on those uh, monitors and devices linked directly to the equipment that we have in the field that kind of give us an indication of, of what's going on at that high resolution. So this photo that I have here on the, on the PowerPoint is directly from a producer that works with us. And this was just taken a, a few weeks ago when he was harvesting wheat. So in it, you can see the things that we're all familiar with. We've got the combine and you've got the little monitor in the bottom right telling you how fast we're going, how fast the turbine's spinning, et cetera, et cetera. But then up in the top right corner is, is he has this little uh, yield monitor and this one happens to be from Ag, Ag Leader. And so this yield monitor is the device that is actually giving us the data that we use to visualize this stuff. And then finally, I have the truck at the end of the field circled to, to show a lot of times we we look at production and well, how many trucks came out? You know, I, I had these many trucks filled at the end of this field, so I know if that's high or low. That doesn't give us the, the indication of the spatial variability, which we see from the yield monitor by telling us that certain parts of the field yielded higher or lower. So the focus more in on what we're talking about, I have the yield monitor on the left, so that's showing the map as he's going through the field. Now it's not like exact, but the spatial patterns and the trends that we see are hold up really well. This is giving him an indication of what his yield is, and this one it's a little grainy, but it's around 80 bushels at that exact moment. He's got a moisture content, how many acres he's harvesting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So our lab, and if you've ever seen Bruno talk or had some, uh, myself give a presentation on this, this is, this is the MO of our lab. We just show maps and maps and maps, and we can change them to any color that's out there. But, but the real benefit to the farmer comes when we can change that and quantify those maps related to profit, and that is based on cost of production. So cost of production varies across every farm. Everybody's doing it a little bit differently, but the goal is the same. You need to make money. And if you don't make money, we're not farming, right? So what we do is we take the map that we have from the farmer, the yield map, and we actually then to get a little bit more serious, we'll say, well, what is your cost of production for this particular crop in this particular year? And a Good estimation on the wheat for this year was $550 
an acre just to plant it and grow that crop. That includes the fertilizer, that includes his land rent if he doesn't own the farm, that includes the machinery equipment cost that is estimated over the whole farm over, over uh, that given year. And then finally, we ask, well, what do you sell it for? And, and this one, we're using an average of about $6 a bushel. So this particular map shows different trends. We should see areas of green, we see areas of red. And those areas of green, in my legend at the bottom, I have the green is making us money. We're seeing zero to 50, upwards of more than $200 a, a acre and profit made for that. And then in the red areas, that's the opposite. We're, we're seeing that those red areas, we didn't make money. Not only did we not make money, we lost money. And some, in some cases, we lost money of more than $200 an acre. Now, none of those areas are exactly bigger than an acre, but if you add up all of those areas in the red, you come close, become pretty close to it. So this works really well <clears throat> if farmers have these kind of data cataloged. And we know that from going years back, the cost of farming has gotten more expensive and that's due to many factors, market inflation, um, grain prices, uh, you know, a lot of different things, cost of machinery is going up, technology fees, I'm sure. So we can detail that and go back for as many years as we have those data and say, well, we can look and see that the cost of growing corn in 2020 was 650. That's $100 more last year than what we had before. And 2023, we expect that to be even higher. And soybeans and wheat are following those same trends. So what we do is we're taking those values to each map that we have from the machine and we're able to put uh, kind of an understanding, uh, look at the trends that we have of these different spatial patterns. So on the left, I have that same field quantified from the 2018 soybean map. And the production cost in that year was $500 an acre and the grain price was sold for around $10. In 2019, the middle map, I have wheat, so I already showed that one. And then the map on the right is the 2020 corn year, and the production cost was 700, and we sold it for about 390. I have highlighted in red areas that regardless of the crop, regardless of the year, we lost money. And Every farmer that we talk to, whether or not they have cataloged this data or not, whether or not they have yield monitors, whether or not they know what their cost of production is, every farmer can attest to, I have parts of my field that I know are the better parts and they make me money. And I have parts of my field that don't. And so the next question that we have with is, well, if we can catalog that, if we can reveal those different spatial patterns, you know, what is it that we can be done about that? So this map that I have, takes all of those years of data that we have and it adds them together. So we get one clear map, one clear indication of where in the field we have losses and where in the field we have profits. And when we look at individual years and we say, okay, well, 19 was a good year for wheat, but it wasn't necessary for corn because we had this prevent plant going on. And, you know, in 2023, well, the, the, it was pretty dry really early on. Yes, in looking at individual years, we can make a case for we could have done things differently, but that's all hindsight. The larger sum of all of these years together makes a pretty clear pattern that in this particular field, the areas surrounding the field lost money, lost a lot of money, in fact. And this is over 12, 12 years of data. And if you look at the satellite base map behind that, you just see trees, right? Because Michigan was historically this this large area of forested uh, state that hundreds of years ago, people said, let's, let's farm it, let's cut pieces out of this field and try to domesticate agriculture. Well, we still have some of those legacy effects of the, of the animal mitigation, animal wildlife from that, <clears throat> which is causing those problems. So one of our projects that we have uh, is asking farmers to detail that area that is losing money and remove it from production. And so our project is paying farmers about $200 an acre to have that ground not farmed. And we plant a biological conservation area 
into what we call native spaces with uh, pollinators and different forbs and different native grasses to Michigan. And they go around those areas that are, we see from the data revealing losses of money and take it out of production. And I know that sounds pretty crazy, but if you were to go back and look at the data uh, that you're losing money, it seems that taking something to put it back into a native space is better than losing it at all. So in this picture, I have a farmer who, of course, that corner that he had that was always showing up as, as red, regardless of the yield map and the year, um, we gave him money to put these seeds down and, and this was applied in the fall. And you can see that he has these uh, grasses growing up in that spot. So this is uh, the last two slides that I have. The, um, the imagery, because our lab is working in, in remote sensing and precision data. So the precision data is coming from the yield monitors and then the conversation with the farmer to delineate, okay, how much are we spending? How much are we giving back to actually look at that profit? But from a remote sensing standpoint, so this map, these maps have images from the plane and satellite actually was taken uh, to collect this. So on the top left, I have a field uh, that was soybeans in 2019. And on the left, you can see that where those areas are trees and those wooded areas, that farmer had a bad soybean crop, let's just say, because the middle of that field, even closer to the road and the sheds, we've got nice green, healthy soybean plants. But on the west side of that field, close to the tree lines, I can see a lot more brown, a lot more bare spots. And so in 19, with this, if he did, when he did get his soybeans in, you know, those areas are more compacted from being on the headlands. And so he was driving over them or they were shaded from the trees that were there or the trees took up all the moisture that was there instead of the plants. A lot of issues can happen and, and also wildlife too. I mentioned a lot of these spots we can, we can say with high confidence that we have a rodent problem throughout that. And so our analysis reveals the middle map in the yellow where we want to remove those spots. And then on the right, we have the image of the farmer who actually did that. And so this is an image from 2022 or 2023 where that was implemented in 22. And this is the image from the, from the spring. So we have good biomass on the green and then um, the rest of the field was fallow. So my last slide that I have is the biggest question we get from farmers saying, well, I don't want to remove part of the field because that'll just make the deer or whatever is causing that wildlife damage, whatever is causing that to move further on into my into my area, into my good crops. Great question. So right now we have a student who is setting up these trail cams that I have in the picture on the left in some of the fields and areas that we have these seeded to, to actually assess the damage caused by wildlife. And the hypothesis being that these animals are more comfortable in <clears throat> a wooded area and will not necessarily go and bed in these native spaces and then further move on to eat the, the main crop that we see in the middle of the field. So we're trying to look at, we have three different exper uh, replications in this with a control field, a control field with one of these native spaces, and then we had a farmer actually implement kind of some strips of where we had non-planted uh, crop and then cover crop left over from the spring. And so you can see from his results, uh, he definitely has indication of some of the uh, culprits of the damage. And that is all that I had. Wonderful, Rich. Thank you so much. Okay, and you can actually take it down then because it's the Q and A time. So we have uh, Rich and. Jeff on here, but I want that we can ask questions too, but I want to go ahead and allow um, Chris at this time to to give a little update if she's capable of that. I am. You okay, got I'm internet? I, no, I'm sitting in my car <laughs> in a parking lot. So 
sorry, everybody, I had a family emergency and I, I literally put some crap in a bag and drove to Pennsylvania and uh, didn't really have internet access, just my phone. So uh, I will try to put something better together and work with Monica to get that posted because a lot of you had pictures and sent me uh, stuff. But w Western Bean is flying. It has been for about three weeks. Marty actually sent me a picture of some hatching. So, uh, you know, when you get those high numbers in corn and you reach a peak, that's when the, the scouting should, should take place. Um, for dry beans, it's a lot easier. When you accumulate about 120, you could go out and look to see when you have pod damage. But most people use that 120 in the bucket kind of, kind of uh, timing to go out and, and actually treat. So in dry beans, it's a little bit different than, than, uh, than corn. I get a lot of questions about fungicides and Marty and I both agree that we that you should default to your fungicide timing, optimize your fungicide application because uh, it's, you know, sometimes these these Western beans egg lay and drag it out for like three weeks and it is hard to time uh, the, the, the application at times. The good thing is Jeff's rains that pounded in the last day or two Little larvae, when they get pounded by a raindrop, they're kind of dead. They can wash off the plant. So some of that could help also for European corn borer too. So some of that could, could help. I had a bunch of questions about rootworm feeding by adults. They will scrape leaves if they come out before the silks and the tassels have emerged. And it, it looks ugly, but on the plant, it doesn't do very much. They'll switch over to silk and tassel once those things come out. Uh, but you do have to be careful for that silk clipping with the Japanese beetles as well. So it's that half inch silk clipping. Uh, and I've, I, again, I've only seen this maybe once or twice in a field that I thought had enough silk clipping to be bad. And those were BT failure fields. Uh, so it's not very common, but that leaf feeding by rootworms can look ugly, but uh, they, they don't really want to feed on leaves. They're, they're waiting for the for tassel to come out. And finally, if you've got soybean aphid, that soybean aphid threshold is excellent. 250 per plant, big happy fat aphids on the top, biocontrol is losing out. And remember the, the, the loss from aphids is occurring at more like 650 per, per plant. So you got, you got time to, to see who's gonna win out here. Those earliest planted fields would have been infested first. And now the later planted fields, the juiciest fields um, may, may be getting infested. But even though we had a few infestations, it sounds like biocontrol was cleaning up a lot of those. So other than that, I mean, I, I had, you guys sent me some really cool pictures, which I have sort of in a slide set that I will try to work up with, with uh, Monica, but I think that's all. And what I'll try to do, or maybe what someone can do is throw my email into the chat and I can always answer questions through my phone to you if you have a dire insect emergency. So thanks to everybody for leaping in there, Rich, for his presentation. I, I really appreciate this. Thank you, Chris, for the update. And yeah, the tracks around the Central Michigan area are just nearing 100. So, um. yeah. So, and again, I, Marty may be talking about tar spot in a in a bit here, but you know, default to that tar spot timing, and uh, you know what what then if there's insecticide in that spray mix, whatever they kill, they kill, and that's what we're you know, and and that's it. So. All right. Thank you so much, Chris. And thanks for being able to get on. We, we appreciate it. But you're very much allowed to not be on. Too, so. <laughs> <laughs> I would always be on. This is the best thing I do every week. So, <laughs> um, We've got a couple questions coming in, but I did want to go ahead and let Marty comment back to and give a little update on Tar Spot. And then we'll move into your questions, Rich, if that's okay. Sounds good. Hey, good morning. Um, looks like my video is off. Um, you guys can fix that maybe and uh, allow screen sharing. But um, really quick before I forget, on the white mold front, um, there is increased risk of white mold um, up in the thumb area. We are finding white mold apothecia um, in Montcalm under irrigation. So, you know, if you've dealt with that in the past, I would just, you know, keep that in mind. 
Um, on the tar spot front, so far we only have a confirmation in um, Munro County, so down uh, southeast. There's quite a bit popping in Ontario. They did have a little bit more uh, moisture than us, I believe, um, and also in um, northern Indiana. Um, and in fact, we have a more updated thing here somewhere, but... Um, Ooh, show you this real quick. So here, so Indiana, so quite a few counties in Indiana are popping now. Um, one of those bordering um, southwest Michigan there. So tar spots starting to be found, but really it's 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 starting to get on the late-ish side. Um, certainly be out there and scout. Um, the risk on the tar spot model has actually decreased a bit, but with these rainfall events, I would I would be you know concerned just to be sort of keeping an eye on things there. Um, so in addition to just having reports of tar spot on plants, we are doing some work uh, with trap, um, spore traps around the state. So we have about five traps spread around the state. So thanks very much. Uh, so there's people uh, participating there. Um, and so we're processing those weekly. And so far, all of those traps have been negative. Um, it's a little bit different to Western Maine cutworm. We, we don't have a lure. We can't really concentrate things. We're just so dependent on what's in the air right there. But it's an element of uh, research. We want to see if we can use it as a prediction tool um, in the future. So that's what I have. Uh, I guess in terms of if it was my farm making a fungicide application, I would personally be holding that fungicide a little bit. There's a little bit of grey leaf spot out there that's confusing a few people because the lesions are very small yet. Um, they, you know, considering that potentially tar spot, but it's not. So if you have any, um, you know, suspects, uh, please send me a, a photo and I can help you ID that. And I'll put my um, contact details here in the chat. So I think that's what I have. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's jump in then to the questions. So the first one we have, um, Rich, some of our fields might have variable production costs by accident, such as an odd-shaped corner or round structures in fields like power poles, which overlap and production application occurs. In those cases, could you create a variable production cost map to go along with the yield map to improve the profit map? Yeah, so I responded to Brooke uh, in the chat, but I'll read it here. Um, how we make the profit maps comes from the yield maps, and it's a pretty simple calculation. It's just that cost of production that we'd have to get from the farmer that's for the, for the, usually it's for the whole farm. We don't ever get it individually by field, but then oh. we relate it back to the yield map times whatever the grain price they sell for. And again, that's usually for the whole farm, not necessarily for the whole field. You could get as as specific as you wanted to with what we call a much higher greater spatial resolution, but um, it's usually you see trends more so related to the yield map because the yield map is the part that's the biggest what if the big wow. variable in that scenario. Because cost production is pretty similar, grain price is pretty similar. Those are pretty stationary, but if the yield varies, so say you're talking soybeans, if the yield varies from like 80 bushels in one spot, like 30 bushels in the next, and that makes a big difference. And so you're going to see a big difference in the cost of production from that. When you're looking at like, oh, these implements cross over, blah, 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 then, then you're kind of at the mercy of the resolution of whatever implement we're talking about. So with the corn header, you know, we're getting a data point for every, say the, the farmer has a yield monitor on a corn header that's 30 feet. You know, we're getting a data point for every every single second or two seconds that that monitor is collecting it per that that size. So that's some of the things to consider. I know we made a prescription map for nitrogen for Brooke, and our typical nitrogen prescription maps are between 90 and 120 feet grid size. So 90 by 90 or 120 by 120. But Brooke was telling me he fertilizes with like a 15, 12 foot applicator. Well, we can get much more precise because he's able to, to go with that smaller applicator. And um, so it just kind of depends farm by farm. Right. Uh, Rich, how many years are the field studies going to be repeated next to what row crops? 
So um, we, Paso is the PI of our group. And if anybody's had the, the pleasure of interacting with Bruno, they will understand that, that this is someone who does, this is a guy who does not stop. And so I suspect that Bruno will be continuing to look for partners to kind of implement these strategies, whether it be the conservation area that I described in the talk. We have other projects where we're looking for cooperators to let us come out and take soil samples, take plant samples, give us your precision data, let us fly the drone on different things. And all of that really kind of has to have a conversation with the farmer to, to get an understanding of, you know, what's going on in that. Um, so our BCA study that I presented with the student um, who's doing it, this is his first year sticking trail cameras to quantify the wildlife damage that's going on. And, you know, that'll have to be repeated for probably two or three years in order to get some data because there's obviously variability in cycles of animals and where these different things are placed. So, um, yeah, it'll be coming. So anybody who wants to, I put my email and phone number uh, in the chat. So anybody who wants to work with us and share data and, you know, have us run this stuff, um, we are a research lab. We don't sell anything. We don't ask anybody to give us money for that. We just help, we just take the farmer's data, process it, and then give it back in some sort of analysis or that helps make sense of things. So that's kind of the goal of our group. All right. And Rich, we do have cameras out in field watching feeding for a soybean trial, actually. So mm -hmm. if you want to process my data, I'd be happy to share all that with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to yeah. doing it. So yeah. <laughs> And that includes Phil, too. He's got a field as well. So awesome. All right. We had a question in here. It was for Chris on what that 120 trigger. Is that a one trapping, like one week, one trap, or is that cumulative? And the, uh, the, yeah. the, the, one, the 120 is cumulative if you're trapping dry beans. That trap is right next to the dry bean field. Out west, they use thresholds of like 800 in, in dry beans to time a spray, and that never worked for us. It was always much lower. So 120, 1, 150, that's in dry beans. It doesn't work for corn because in corn, they're being pushed and pulled around the landscape to find pre-tassel corn. So you can have 500 in a bucket next to a corn field, and they're not interested in that corn field. So that, that trap catch doesn't relate to corn. It's a dry bean thing. So 120, 150, and then think about spraying in a, in a couple of weeks. And the, most of you who have, who have beans have, have been doing that for the last, you know, 10 years. So we're pretty good with it. All right. Thank you, Chris. There's also a really, we have insect, the insect guide on the field crops teams page. I can go ahead and grab that and paste it in the chat box. And there's a really good bulletin. Um, Chris has several great bulletins about uh, how to scout and identify those pests out in the field. So you know what you're looking for. Uh, the next question, and that's for Rich. Is there an online platform where farmers can upload yield maps and cost of production info to get profit, profitability maps generated either free or fee-based? That has been a goal of Bruno's lab for probably the past three or four years is to kind of set something up on that. But the infrastructure necessary to have like a website where you can have the right file format, it's really hard to do. And so the easiest way to set something like that up is just to contact me via my email and then I can share a, a cloud service uh, link through like OneDrive or Dropbox or Google Drive, where those maps can then be uploaded, we'll process, and then we'll share the maps. And we can even share shape files or rasters if farmers want to implement those into their own, you know, spatial software program of its farm logs or SMS, whatever it may be, we work with them all. Um, but yeah, I think the, the big component of saying, you know, this could be something that you know, somebody could just go to a website and do. And that's definitely is a great idea and a great question. But it's we don't have something like that yet. 
um but we're we're working towards it <laughs> it's a dream okay yeah, yeah right yeah and there's no other service that does something like that either nothing that for our for our process it's it's academics right we we aren't selling anything to anybody so the analysis that that we give is true to you know what the farmer gives us for information regarding you know this is my yield map this is what i pay for it and and that's what we put out now other services do offer something similar like there's um the process that there's cortiva has something and i know climate had something similar in that that component but there's a large fee associated with getting those software package there's uh kind of the proprietary nature of working with a company that that goes ahead and, and does that for you is is i'm not saying i wouldn't trust it but there's always a little caveat with with putting your data into a big large company and you know what you get out you're obviously paying for it somehow whether or not that's you're paying for the fee or um a, a monthly fee or a service fee so um there's that to consider all right all right thank you so much rich mm -hmm. see uh, marty is there a national spore trap network across corn growing states in monitoring tar spot that growers can access um, no, there's no national spore trap network. Um, it costs a considerable amount of dollars to do that. Um, it, we're really just in the research phases of, I mean, we just created an assay for this tar spot to detect this tar spot pathogen from spores and infected leaf samples. So it's all kind of on the early research phase side of things. But I mean, if, if we did demonstrate a good proof of concept, that's potentially something that could be done. All right. Great. Thanks, Marty. And those tornado trap things are pretty cool. We got one out at a farm in my area. And, uh, I really appreciate having it. Uh, we do have the Tar Spotter app, though. So although you maybe can't see the results from um, the sport traps, you can get on and see what the tar spot pressure is in a given area using the model on there. Yeah, the, the tar spotter model is just modeling risk, right? So it doesn't incorporate whether the disease is present or not. So you need to understand that. And that's where if you guys see it in a county, like let me know and I can put it on that national map so you know where it's being found. So you can keep that in mind as well. But yeah, that's that's kind of where we're at with detection and risk prediction tools. Okay. All right. I believe I uh, caught all of the questions in the chat box um at this time we we do have, we do in theory have till eight o'clock of course we'll end early if there's no questions but if anybody wanted to unmute themselves to ask a question this would be a great time to do it otherwise we'll pause for just a little bit here monica are there any other specialists that wanted to give an update today We'll provide them an opportunity as well. I was kind of looking through the names to see if I can force anyone to talk. Scott, I don't know if you want to unmute yourself and say anything about dry beans. I've also, um, or Dennis, about how wheat harvest is, falling numbers, anything like that. Yeah, sure thing, Monica. Um, I think most of what I kind of have got covered by Marty and Chris, but uh, we're definitely at elevated risk for white mold. Um, I think most growers are aware of that, you know, mold applications have been ongoing. Um, and I know there were some questions about the heat, you know, suppressing things, but I would urge growers, if you still have fields yet and you're scheduled to spray, that we take care of those this year. Um, and then obviously keep an eye on Western meat cutworm numbers. Um, other than that, you know, the crop's looking pretty good and harvest will be here before long. Great. Thank you, Scott. And then Dennis, I'm not sure if you can, you're able to unmute. I do see that we have a couple of young growers on here. So if you have yeah, a good morning, you Monica. get them in, get your, get your data in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So wheat harvest is wrapping up across the state. Uh, overall yields have been highly variable depending on available water um, areas and light textured soils with uh, low rainfall, you know, yields have been very poor. Um, but we've also had fields where we've had near record yields. So, um, yeah, it's just kind of all over the board as far as the yield. It just depends on how much rain you got and how much water 
your soils have been able to hold on to and provide to that plant during that dry spell what your yield was. We did have uh, a few pockets of uh, poor falling numbers, which is an indicator of pre-harvest sprout. Um, and so we did have some feed wheat and not milling quality wheat as a result of that. Um, those were somewhat localized areas scattered across the central part of the state and into the thumb area. Um, but not everybody was having the falling number of problems. Uh, vomitoxin was not a problem this year, but as you remember back during the flowering time, uh, it was so very dry then, uh, we just didn't get any infection uh, by fusarium. So uh, yeah, overall, uh, yeah, I think wheat harvest is getting just about wrapped up and uh, yeah, that's about all I have, I guess. Great, thank you, Dennis. I had just asked Star of the West at um, one of their locations, what they estimated for like a regional loss across the Saginaw Bay. And I think he said about a 30% is, is for, the, for that area is what he estimated, so. Yeah, that due to falling number, you mean? Just the weather that caused a yield deficit before it even came in. That's what he asked. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, um, Ira, I see you've unmuted yourself. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure. I was trying to see in the chat box here. Maybe I didn't see it right. What was uh, our speaker's contact information again? Is that in the box? It is in the chat box, but I can go ahead and re um, paste it in for you since a lot of things have come through. Yeah, because I, I was looking for it and I didn't see it. All right, okay. thank you. Yeah, I can do that. And then... Um, Lyndon, did you want to give any update about irrigation? Sure, if I can. Can you hear me, Monica? Yes, I can. Thank you. Um, this has been, uh, it's, it's great to have some rain. It gives you a little respite from using all the irrigation for the irrigation folks. But um, we've had about eight weeks straight here where our rainfall has not met crop use. Um, even this week, if uh, we're, our use is going to be up around that one and a half inches for corn and soybeans, and uh, very few of us are going to get one and a half inches, that creates an opportunity. Um, some of the driest, lowest water table um, situations that we have should be coming up here in the next couple of weeks. So if you're thinking about adding irrigation, now's the time to do the homework to see where the water table would be in those dry spells. So I know it's sort of tough. Everybody thinks about getting through this year, but now's a really good time to be planning. If you're thinking about adding irrigation, do you have the water supply that could sustain irrigation? And unless, unless we just have a total turnaround in, in rainfall and we get two or three inches each week, it should be a good year during early August to take a look at those water tables. And be glad to help anybody um, that's thinking about irrigation explore that opportunity. Um, now's the time to buy. Now's the time to look. Great. Thank, Thank you, you. Linda. Linda, I have a quick question for you if you have a, a second here. I have a forage producer that is irrigating alfalfa and a grass combination. And he normally puts on small amounts over the course of a week. Uh, in these fields between grazings, is that something where he should put on greater amounts over an inch to get a better effect on those fields that he's irrigating? So there's two factors here. Every time we do an application, we help cool the crop from the evaporation that happens from the water surface, from the soil surface and the plant surface, which is a benefit. But if we're talking about transpiration, the water used to grow the crop, to grow food, to grow and uh, create energy within the plant, that is reduced. Um, every time I do a one inch application, I lose about a 10th of an inch to evaporation. That's water that didn't make it to the root system of the plant. If I do two half inch applications that week, I've lost two tenths of an inch to evaporation and I get a net uh, eight tenths to the crop. If I did it as one one inch application, I, I gain a tenth of an inch because I only had one evaporation loss. Um, but there's other factors out there. I'd be uh, glad to talk to, to people about that. There's a runoff factor for applying water too quick. 
Um, there are some crop cooling, a lot of our gladiolas and things, we like to crop cool. There are other factors, but uh, be glad to work with him, with your grower if he's interested. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. I think with that, uh, we have, we're, and we're right at eight o'clock, so that was perfect timing. So thank you everyone for joining us for another virtual breakfast. Um, we really appreciate your uh, continued support and getting on here. And then we'll see you next week to talk about drainage, another topic that goes well with irrigation. So have a wonderful day and we'll uh, we'll see you next week.